Heavenly Father, as we open our study this morning, we ask that you'd pour the latter rain out upon us, that you would take charge of my humanity, that you'd overrule my wisdom, my knowledge, and speak to us. Um, we ask that you'd prepare our hearts and minds to understand and accept what you have for us. We thank you for the Sabbath, the easy times, which are soon to be removed. Um, please bless us with uh, light from on high is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Kind of a long scripture reading, and I hope you understand that that cloud is also referred to as a pillar, pillar of fire by night, cloud by day. And I hope that we can get through the material because it's not until the very end of this presentation that I will address that scripture reading. Um, it's nice that in Sabbath school, Daniel dealt with the kings of the earth briefly there. He was touching on them. Um, because on the page one of your notes, you, the title of this presentation is Ruling Power. Amerigo Vespucci, I guess is how you pronounce it. Yes. Um, Amerigo, as a boy's name, is of Italian and old German origin, and the meaning Amerigo is work ruler, home ruler. Italian form of Germanic name Almeric, from Amal meaning work, and Rick meaning rule power. The name means merchant ruling power, and this name is what is used to name America. America is named after this Italian, I think he was Italian, um, explorer. And uh, his name means merchant ruling power. And of course, we understand the Ten Kings are also these merchants. And the premier one is the United States. And we've been looking at a connection between the King of the South and the United States. The King of the South, beginning in France, typified the United States. The King of the South, two horns, the United States, two horns. France placed the papacy on the throne of the earth. The United States will place the papacy upon the throne of the earth. And in doing so, we went into the French Revolution and identified that the end of France was was took place in connection with the beginning of the United States. Therefore, Jesus illustrates the end with the beginning and therefore the end of France would be typifying the end of the United States. But the end of France is also going to typify the end of the Soviet Russia, of Russia, who is the modern king of the South. So with this study, you have connections that are consistent with the definition of Ezekiel looking into the most holy place at midnight on November 9th, 2019, and seeing all these wheels within wheels. There's connections between these lines that, that are pretty complex at first view, but they're not that complex. Now I'm gonna do some, I tend to spend some time on the board. I hope that's easy enough for my brother to follow. This is the board I'll use, at least initially. I wanna do a little bit of review, then I wanna get into the presidents of the United States which is also review, and then I hope to get into the presidents of the Adventist Church, which is also review, but even though we've put these things in the public record before, we are understanding things differently now, or, or more fully now, I guess is the way to say it. Where, uh, where to begin? We're saying, I'm saying, that this is the midnight cry, and that this is the Sunday law. And as we've looked at the beginning of the King of the South in France and the French Revolution, I'm saying that this is 1789 to 1798-99. Um, and we've looked at several characteristics. We've looked at three Three manifestations of the French Revolution that have different dates, okay, 1793 to 1796 was the Vendée War, was the Reign of Terror. This is the, the time period Sister White would mark as the Reign of Terror, but I marked 1793 to 1794 
as the primary reign of terror beginning on July 27th, 1793 and ending on July 27th, 1794. So from the French Revolution we had three lines that we're plugging into history and saying that they're lining up with July 18th, 2020 and December 25th, 21. Okay, so I'm going to take this off here. We also, if you can remember, spent some time looking at a prophecy that we've referred to a lot, the prophecy of Christ. How old was Christ when he was baptized? Twelve. He was 30 years old when he was baptized. And we, this is where he was empowered. And we would line up in our study that the papacy was empowered in 538. Paralleling this. These aren't line up on line now. I hope I don't confuse you. But what I want you to see here is that there was a 30 year preparation for Christ. He was 30 years old when he was baptized. Was there a 30 year, old, 30 year preparation for the papacy? 508. And what happened in 508 that marks 508 as the beginning of this 30 years of preparation for the papacy? The daily was taken away. And what was the daily? Paganism. paganism. And what was paganism in that history? Paganism is a religion, but what, what, who represented paganism in that history? All France. Okay, he's saying France. Um, I'm saying that Rome disintegrated, right? Rome's the fourth kingdom of Bible prophecy. Is that not correct? Pagan Rome. It's going to transcend into papal Rome. And as it changes from pagan Rome to papal Rome, you have 30 years preparation. So I'm looking at it from the leadership of pagan Rome. All right. Yes. Okay. So consider pagan Rome. This is all review. When did pagan Rome begin to disintegrate? In the year 330, Constantine had did what? Nine years earlier. A Sunday law in 321. And the rule of a Sunday law is national apostasies followed by national ruin. So in the year 330, the, the ruin of the fourth kingdom of Bible prophecy, the kingdom of Bible prophecy that we say typifies the United States. Right? Pagan Rome typifies the United States. So in the year 330, the first beginnings of the disintegration of the United States begins in the year 330 because of a Sunday law as typified by Constantine passing that first Sunday law and then what did he do in 330? He moved the capital of the empire from the city of Rome to the city of Constantinople thus doing what? Whether he meant to or not, what did he do? He divided the kingdom into two parts. Are these two parts a subject of Bible prophecy? Yes, they are addressed in Revelation. What are the two parts? The east and the west. But there was more disintegration coming, right? In the east, Constantine's now in Constantinople. He's going to divide the kingdom into three parts. Into his three, give one part to one son, one part to another son, and another part to another son. Constantine the second, Constance, and some other variation of Constant. He named all of his sons. It, it, it's like a brother that's watching here today has four sons that they all have the same first name. So he's kind of like Constantine. Constantine divides the kingdom into three parts. So what I want you to see is first the kingdom's divided into two parts, east and west. If you know that, say amen. amen. But because of the Sunday law, what's going to happen? The trumpets are going to begin to, to blow. So what happens to Western Rome with the onslaught of the trumpets? It goes from a united kingdom to a divided kingdom into east and west. And in Western Rome, what happens from that point? 
it's going to disintegrate into how many kingdoms? Ten kingdoms. Easy to see, right? And ultimately, it's going to get to a new prophetic symbol, the king of the south. Now, the king of the south is not the sixth kingdom of Bible prophet, fifth kingdom of Bible prophecy. It's not a kingdom of Bible prophecy. Pagan Rome's a kingdom of Bible prophecy, and papal Rome's a kingdom of Bible prophecy. And the arrival of the king of the south at the end of the disintegration of western Rome into ten kingdoms is just a prophetic line that we have to watch. It's what we're dealing with. The French Revolution taking place right at the beginning of the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy. Are you with me? So, go back to 508. In 508, paganism was removed. What does that mean to you? If you're looking at political power, both sides had to get in line with the rise of the papacy. What do I mean by both sides? I mean the East in Constantinople and the West. The West is divided into ten kingdoms. And who's going to come to the side of the papacy in the West? Clovis, king of France. Who's going to come to the side of the papacy in Constantinople? Who, who wrote the... Where was the person that wrote the decree in 533 that made the Pope the corrector of heretics? Justinian. Where was he? He's in that story, isn't he? Okay, so what I want you to see, I won't, I won't labor this anymore. But in the 30 years of preparation for the papacy, there were two powers that were representing paganism that had to be removed, that had to be surrender to the papacy before it could rise. And what we're saying is, is that in this history here, that back in 1989 through 91, you have the collapse of the Soviet Union leaving Russia as the King of the South. But it's a two-year period. It begins on November 9th, midnight, 1989. And the final demise takes place on December 25th, 1991. This is of the Soviet Union, thus illustrating that down here, how many years later, Russia is going to be taken away? How many years later? 30 years. But what happened also in 1991 in the, in the USA? What did the President of the United States, George Bush I, do in 1991 in his State of the Union address? Called for a new world order, and the new world order is going to come into history here 30 years later. What do we call Russia and the United States in terms of directions? The United States is the West. What is Russia? East. Eastern Rome and Western Rome had to be taken away in 1991 and 30 years later the papacy is going to be placed upon the throne of the earth in agreement with this history over here of 30 years after paganism's taken away both eastern and western rome takes you to 538 you see that okay so i i want us to have that in our mind as we proceed through this what we're saying here now I, when i'm saying this is review on page one of your note I'll read these little historical facts so I can refer to them, but I'll put them in place under the Revolution and the Constitution. The Constitution, 1989, or 1789, same year that the Constitution of France, the Rights of Man, is put in place. Two primary authors that work together. One American, Thomas Jefferson, 
and one, the Marquis de Lafayette, Lafayette. They both interacted. One is the primary author of the Constitution for France. The other is the primary author of the Constitution of the United States. They're both implemented in 1989. Revolutionary War was from 1789. 1789. Don't let me get away with that. Revolutionary War was from 1775 to 1783. Um, the First Continental Congress, October 14th, 1774, and what is the Continental Congress for? No answers there? I'll read on, I'll, I'll, and, and so I get through this. May, May 10, 1775, Second Continental Congress, Congress meets in Philadelphia to co coordinate the war effort, the Revolutionary War. June 15, 1775, Virginian George Washington is named as the colonist's first commander-in-chief. The first commander-in-chief would typify, typify, typify what? The last commander-in-chief. Who's the commander-in-chief currently? Okay, Washington's typified him. November 15th, 1777, Congress adopts the Articles of what? Confederation. As the government of the United States of America ratified on March 1st, 1781. And Samuel Huntington, the seventh pre president of the Continental Congress from September 28, 1779 to July 9, 1781, and also the first of the ten presidents that ruled with the Articles of Confederation and his Constitution. Here's what I want to say here. The Continental Congress met a couple times, but its purpose was to write a constitution because they were starting a new government. Okay, and from the beginning there that we just read, there were seven presidents, but the seventh president is also going to be the first of ten presidents that exist during the time that the Articles of Confederation are operating. They don't have a constitution over here. What are they doing here? They're working on the constitution. I'm going to put their building. Does that work for you? Building the constitution. Is that valid? Yeah. But here, now you have your first president, George Washington. When's that? 17. 89. Under the Constitution. Under the Constitution. Okay, lots you can do there, but this is 1789. What we've been studying about the French Revolution, this is 1789, and this is 1789. Right? So as a line upon line student, what would you do? You'd grab this line and you'd put it in here. Yes? Except for one thing. What's the one thing? It's something that I've, I've taken a whole lot of time. I'm not making up no cover story. I've taken a lot of time to put this in place. The doubling of the midnight cry. Okay, so if, if you're not going to, if you're going to factor that in, and I'm going to take these off now. I've made that point. If you're going to factor that in, then this here is 1789. Everyone with me? Because this history here, the image of the beast in the United States, is typifying the history of the image of the beast in the world. Okay? So if we do it that way, and this is 1789, then we have... This being the Constitution, is it put in place? Yes. Fully destroyed. Because when it started, it was put in place back here, 1789, and it's typifying when the Constitution is fully removed. What was it preceded by? The number 10. 
Okay, well, ten, that's a testing. But what do we know about this history from the Midnight Cry of the Sunday Law? We know lots. This is a big history. But what do we know is happening here with the United States? It's going down, is it not? The, and it's the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy. And what is going up at the same time? It's the rise of the ten kings. When are the ten kings going to be in place? Right here. That ten is there. Go ahead. Could it also be the ratification of the new constitution for the world? I mean, it, the death of the old one, but the, the new one comes into play when the tenth kingdom gets up there. Hey, uh, that would be uh, given by the uh, tenth kingdom. Okay, maybe, right. maybe. It could be lots of things. We're just taking the high road, the, or the, the, the mountain peaks of this. But what I want you to see is in this movement for... 20 years, we have put in the public record, go to Isaiah 8, just briefly. We have spirit of prophecy quote after spirit of prophecy quote after spirit of prophecy quote to uphold what I'm going to point you to. And in Isaiah 8, verse 9, 89. It says, Associate yourselves, O you people, and you shall be broken in pieces, and give ear, all you far countries. Gird yourselves, and you shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, and you shall be broken in pieces. Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand, for God is with us. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy to all them whom this people shall say a confederacy, neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. When Sister White speaks of this passage in Isaiah 8, she quotes this passage repeatedly, repeatedly. And what does she call this confederacy? Evil. The evil confederacy. And what does she define the evil confederacy as in terms of Revelation 16? It's the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. It's the threefold union. It is the evil confederacy that's put in place here. And if you want to say at that point they start their constitution, so be it. But we're looking at the constitution of the United States. But it would start there. In this history here, this is the rise of the confederacy. And what was this history at the beginning? It's the history of the articles of the confederacy. Articles of Confederation was the name of that constitution. And this history here plugs in right here. The Articles of Confederation are identifying when the evil confederacy of the seventh kingdom of Bible prophecy is rising and the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy is going down. And this is based upon the first presidents of the United States. So what's this tell you about this history? That before you get to the midnight cry, there is a period of time marked by the number seven. Yes? And what's happening in this history? The Constitution is being disassembled, torn up. Okay, because it was built here. It was being built here. Now it's going to be taken apart piece by piece. The Patriot Act. Or, or impeaching someone because of your political position, even though they have done no high crimes or misdemeanors. If you've got the votes, you can impeach them. Impeachment is part of the constitutional process. The Constitution in this history is getting destroyed, leading to this history, which is where it's essentially overturned, but the sixth kingdom is going down. Seventh kingdom is coming up, yes. Very, very quickly. Of course, you're not saying that the Articles of Confederation back in the time of George Washington was not evil. No, I, uh, this wasn't evil, this wasn't evil, this wasn't evil. But this is evil, this is evil, and this is yeah, evil. I to clarify for the adult. For, okay, for yes. It's, I'm saying that it's, it's, it's not an accident that it is the Articles of Confederation in here when this is the rise of what Sister White calls the evil confederacy based upon Isaiah 8. And she defines the evil confederacy as the beast, dragon, and false prophet to come together at the threefold union at the Sunday Law. It just fits. Okay, but now I want you to see something here. 
Because of the midnight cry, and because the image of the beast in the United States and then the image of the beast in the world, you have a phenomenon here with, is it Huntington? President Huntington? Let me read this. Um, Samuel Huntington, on, on page one of your notes, it says, President of the United States in Congress assembled. Samuel Huntington. You see that? First President of the United States in terms of these ten kings, but he was also the seventh president when they didn't have a constitution. So he was, at that level, sequentially, he was the eighth. He was the first of these ten, but he was the eighth, but he was of the seven. And that's right here. Okay, so that would be where? It'd be right here, and it'd also be right here. Because this history moves over here. Are you with me? Okay, so what I'm saying is, this is internal. Internal, I need an N in there. And this is external. In, uh, internal and external in reference to... Internal and external in reference to this phenomenon of the eighth is of the seven being fulfilled in this history. Okay, what is this way mark? It's the midnight cry. But in terms of Ezra 7, 9, what is it? Yeah, take it one step further. It's the first day of the fifth month. It's Jerusalem. Okay, this is where the Lord is choosing Jerusalem. We looked at that, I think, in our last presentation, or the past couple of presentations. This is where the Jerusalem's going down, and Jerusalem's getting lifted up as an end sign. Yes? So, this Jerusalem is the 144,000 that are the covenant people that the Lord is entering into covenant with, but He's passing by the former covenant people. In the time of Moses, those people that came out of Egypt, that failed the ten-step testing process, they died in the wilderness, and the Lord entered into covenant with Joshua and Caleb. Bible, Spirit of Prophecy says so. So the first time you have a covenant people mentioned in the Scriptures in relation to Genesis 15's prophecy, you have a covenant people that are being passed by while the Lord is entering into covenant with a new chosen people. And at the end of the history of ancient Israel, you have the same phenomenon. When the Lord is entering into to covenant with the Christian church, He is passing by the Hebrew church. And at the beginning of modern Israel, the beginning of Adventism, when the Lord is entering into covenant with Millerite Adventism, He is passing by the Protestants at the same point in time. When were the Protestants passed by? 1842. Nice guess. When were the Protestants passed by? April 19th, 1844. They have fully rejected the first angel's message and closed the door. Why do you want to be clear about that? Why do you want to be clear that it was on the first day of the first month in 1844 that the covenant people that were the Protestant horn of the United States are set aside for Millerite Adventism? Because based upon three witnesses, the story of Joshua and Caleb, the story of the Christian church in the time of the disciples, and the story of Millerite Adventism, on the first day of the first month, the Old Covenant people, Seventh-day Adventism, will have fully closed their door and the Lord will have entered into covenant with the 144,000. And you want to know that at the beginning of Adventism, that took place on the first day of the first month, and therefore at the end of Adventism, it, gets take, it takes place again. And when was that? 9-11 was the first day of the first month. <coughs> Those of you that follow this message and still raise the question, should I still be worshiping in the Seventh-day Adventist church? Well, take yourself back to Christ's time.
You can go to, to church on Sabbath with Peter and the disciples, or you can go back into the Hebrew synagogue. God, take your choice. Mm -hmm. Or take your, take your mind back to, say, August of 1844. Which tent do you want to be in? Do you want to be in, what was that tent's name? Watertown tent, or do you want to be over there with Millerite Adventism tent when the midnight cry is being presented by Samuel Snow? Okay, because August 15th is well after the first day of the first month, and the Protestants were passed by on the first day of the first month, and 9-11 in this history was the first day of the first month. Amen. Okay, that's outside the scope of this. But here at the midnight cry, now the Lord chooses Jerusalem, and not only chooses it, now He's going to lift it up as an ensign. Isaiah 2, above all the other hills. Okay, he's full, the, the fall of Adventism, just like the fall of the Hebrew church, is progressive. But here there is a distinct action that I'm saying is internal. And what is it? Repeatedly, Sister White says, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the Laodicean Church. What church is that? It's the Seventh Church. He is now passing by the Seventh, and he's entering into covenant with the Eighth, but the Eighth Church is of the Seven. And which church of the Seven Churches typifies the Eighth Church? Ephesus. Ephesus. Ephesus is the church that took the gospel in its purity to the entire world. Okay, so here you have this phenomenon of the eighth of Huntington. The eighth is of the seven. But it gets repeated here too because of the midnight cry, the loud cry, image in the United States, image in the world. What is this one? It's external. It's Revelation 17. Go to Revelation 17. This is an old established truth as well. Revelation 17 has identified the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. It says in verse 10, and there are seven kings. There are seven kings. There are seven kings, five are fallen, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome, and one is, and John's seeing this in 1798, who's the one that is in 1798? It's the United States, and the other has not yet come, what's the seventh kingdom that hasn't come in 1798? United Nations, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. And these have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords, and kings and kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he said unto me, where, where did I pass over? Oh, I passed over verse 11. Verse 11 is where I want to go. Verse 11, And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Who's the eighth? Modern Rome. It's of the seven. It's the eighth kingdom in the sense that it's resurrected, and it was the fifth kingdom. And what happened to the fifth kingdom? It received a deadly wound, and now it's being resurrected. So this phenomenon that's here in the history of the presidents of the United States because of this doubling of this history, is repeated here and here, one's internal, one's external. You have a list of these presidents in your notes. I never intended to read through them. I'm just providing you this information. If you don't... Daniel is President Trump, too, on one respect. So Daniel is President... Samuel. Samuel. Samuel Harrington. Yeah. Okay. Huntington. Is Huntington. Okay, on page two where it says Trump. George Washington was the richest president until Trump. Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. Washington is the first, Trump is the last in terms of the Constitution. He, Washington made his wealth from real estate. How did Trump make his wealth from real estate? And 
it took the longest period of time in history for George Washington to have his cabinet confirmed by the Congress until Trump came along. George Washington, it took a long time because they were starting a brand new government and it just took a long time to figure out how to do things. Trump didn't get his cabinet, re I'm not even sure that his old cabinet's confirmed even now because of other reasons, but they're, they're clear to see that they're type anti-type. But Trump is also the first, Trump is also typified by the first Republican president, which is Abraham Lincoln. Trump is the 19th Republican president. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was from 1861 to 1865. Uh, and in 1863, he frees the slaves with the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, which historians tell us is the dead center of the Civil War, which we know is the point where the Seventh-day Adventist Church rejected the foundational message. 1863... Pardon me? And became a church. Uh, yeah, did many things and became a church. Um, in 1863, because of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln suspended habeas corpus, which at the basic level is almost what's going on here today. It's martial law. Okay, it isn't the kind of martial law that's going to come in after July 18th, but it is surely giving us warning that what we've understood is correct. And it happens in Trump's administration as illustrated by the first Republican president. And this first Republican president was assassinated by the Jesuits on April 4th, 1865. So slavery ends, there's a civil war, assassinated by Jesuits, martial law enacted, and the draft was implemented in that war. Okay. Now there's also a line that we've looked at as we're leading up to this about three world wars. Uh, a triple application, first world war t along with the second world war typifies the third world war. And Woodrow Wilson was the president during the first world war and in that history he, he is the primary historical figure that implements the League of Nations which typifies the United Nations. So World War I you see a characteristic of World War I is a one world government, an attempt at it with the League of Nations and in that war, there was a new type of warfare introduced for that, in that history new, called nerve gas. And the war began with the Europeans, and there was a draft implemented in that war as well. Okay, the draft being implemented may not seem that significant, but the fact that the draft was implemented in the Civil War during Abraham Lincoln's time period is the very reason that James White pushed to start the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He wanted to start the church so he could get a legal status so his boys didn't get drafted into that war. Okay, so the draft is an issue in all of these wars and therefore there's a draft coming in the very near future. What does that tell you when Trump's saying we got our, our military is stronger than it's ever been and we finally turned it around from what Obama did where we got everything going good for us but Bible prophecy says there's going to be a draft. What does that tell you? Why do you draft people? Because something happened so terrible that you don't have enough body to fill the ranks. That's the only reason you use a draft. People don't have jobs. A lot of people don't. Then, a lot of people will. I'm not talking about them joining to make money. I'm talking about being forced. No, I know. I'm okay. just saying that'll, that'll be more of an excuse. Another president uh, in World War II, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He died while the war was still going on. Okay, he's the World War II is followed by the United Nations. The new warfare was atomic weapons. The war began with the Europeans. Martial law was implemented, wasn't it? Where we lived in California, we used to have, we would drive, the place where we drove on a regular basis to go to the mountains and do our thing was by one of the Japanese internment camps in the desert, on the high desert where we lived. And that wasn't the only internment camp uh, in World War II. Is that martial law? When they go and they gather up a race and put them in a camp and keep them there? Okay, martial law in World War II. 
Uh, he died shortly before the end of the war and the draft was implemented in that war. Those are the characteristics that I'm saying get repeated here because I'm saying that this is the third world war. This history here. And that the characteristics of the first two world wars and even the civil war will be fulfilled in here. Okay, now if you're not catching it, I'm saying this is the third world war because I'm saying here from here on, it's not as if it's the world war, it's, it's the persecution of the ten kings against Christ. And Sister White says these ten kings in Revelation 17, they, they persecute the lamb, but she says they persecute him through persecuting his followers. This is where the blood is spilled for this one hour. Okay, That isn't a warfare between kingdoms. This is the cleanup operation because they won the war right here. Okay, and this is where it gets really ugly. This is where you go into a different kind of dictatorship. Okay, you can see on the bottom of page two, the not in sequence, some verses from Genesis 15. I don't have them in sequence because I just wanted to pour, pull certain verses out about who gets judged. I won't read them. They're there for your reference. The prophecy of Abraham talking about God's people going into bondage for 400 slash 430 years identifies three entities that would get judged. God's people, the nation where they went, Egypt, and the Amorites. And the Amorites represent ten nations. Okay, And this is typifying our history when God's people are going to be judged. The United States, as typified by Egypt, will be judged and then the whole world, typified by the ten kings, the Amorites, will be judged in this history. Okay, So there is a judgment taking place upon God's people that has to do with the passing by of the former covenant people. And that is the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which down here in 1863 began its role as a church and it was we put this in the public record quite some time ago that we believed Adventism is going to get dealt with in the very new future 2020, 2021 but that from 1863 to this history there were 20 presidents of the General Conference and our prophecy would have got broken. It would have been broken because the Adventist Church determined that they were going to have a general conference session this year and everyone already knew that their current president, Ted Wilson, was stepping down. He's been there long enough. I don't know that there was anything sinister about it. I'm not saying anything like that, but it was all planned. They're going to get a new general conference president. But because of this pandemic, they have put that general conference off for a couple years. So when we come to this history up here, you'll still have the 20th president of the General Conference. Why does that matter? Well, it matters on the bottom of page 3 because of the role of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the role of the United States. The United States was the land that the Lord raised up the final warning message, which was Adventism. There is a relationship at that level, a prophetic relationship between these two entities. The, the promised land that were given to the chosen people. Okay, But at the prophetic level, what we're looking at here is that there is a distinction between the political side and the religious side. And I'm saying the religious side is the Adventist Church and the political side is the government of the United States. And I'm saying that in the history of ancient Israel, Jeroboam began the northern kingdom by emphasizing the combination of church and state and setting up two golden calves in Bethel and in Dan, based upon Egypt, which is a symbol of politics. And how many kings of the northern kingdom were there? There were 19. How many... What... Republican president 
is it that is the 19th Republican president? No, the, that's Lincoln's the first. When was Lincoln the first Republican president? 1863. Donald Trump is the 19th. How many kings were there in Israel? Is, did somebody say 20? Who said that? I did. There were 19. Okay. How many presidents or how many kings were there in Judah? 20. Until it came to an end at the destruction of Jerusalem. What was the destruction of Jerusalem? Well, it's a Sunday law. So there would be 20 presidents of Adventism. It began in 1863, and sure enough, that's how many there are. Ted Wilson is the 20th president of the General Conference. And since 1863, there have been more presidents, but if you're counting Republican presidents, there's only been 19. And Judah had 20. I'm saying that this is church and this is state. And I'm saying that according to Genesis 15, God's people and the country where they were taken and the whole world get judged during this time period. Okay, you with me? So you have in here, once again for your own edification, you've got a list of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. And then you've got a list of all the presidents of the General Conference in order to look at. And ask yeah, let's ask the question. Doesn't that say that um, and on some level that God recognizes Republicans as leaders of His great nation over the Democrats? And I'll leave that question there. Doesn't that identify at some level that God recognizes Republicans as the leader of His nation? I, I don't think so, but I get I get what you're saying. I think He's using them as a symbol of the United States. Um, I, I, I don't know, maybe. Never thought that one through. So. Two horns of Republicanism and Protestantism. Yeah. <laughs> Republicanism? Republicanism. Republicanism? And Protestantism. I'm not going to get to the end. I can tell. Okay. This is all, we've, we've taught this pri previously. Um, so this isn't new information, but you may have been hearing it for the first time. I'm on page eight of your notes now. The, the four generations of Adventism. This is big stuff. The four generations. Does everyone have that in their, their mindset here? Where I can take it down? That this is the first president. George Washington is the first president, but he was actually preceded by 17 presidents or 16, depending on how you t take it. And we're just bringing that up to here. And our justification, among other arguments, our justification is the Constitution was written in 1789, right? where the French Constitution was written. These two countries, this close prophetic relationship allows us to do this. But because this is the image of the beast in the United States, we can also put 1789 here because this is the image of the beast in the world. Everyone got that? I need some room here. <clears throat> we haven't discussed the four generations of Adventism much recently. But when's, when's the first generation of Adventism begin? 1798. 1798. Now based upon what some people spoke of today, they might say, well, Miller doesn't have his message till 1818. That's okay, I'm just going to put that up here. But this is the first generation of Adventism. And I'm saying the second generation of Adventism begins in 1888. 
It ends in 1919. And it goes to, to when? 1957 or 9. Okay. Uh, uh, the fourth generation goes to 1989. Oh. That's the fourth. You said the third. Oh. No, this is the, the second, the third. Yeah. This here, I'll do it carefully, is the first. This here is the second. And then from here to 1957 is the third. I blew that one. And then the fourth goes to where? I already gave it away. No, not to this end, Dilo. To 89. When did the, the fourth generation? When did the Lord begin to pass by the leadership in the time of Christ? According to Sister White, at the time of the end. At his birth. So the Adventist Church being passed by back here or the Adventist Church is being passed by back here in nineteen eighty nine. The Protestants are being passed by in seventeen ninety eight. It's it's about the covenant relationship. The Lord is now entering into covenant with Millerite Adventism over here. Okay? And he's done so in this history. Twenty years later, take the message isn't put in place by William Miller. And then seventy years later, you have Adventism rejecting the message of the hour. Okay, first generation is over. We're leaving lots of waymarks out there of 1863, 1844, August 11th, 1840. Uh, then you have, what is that, 12, 21 years? 31 years? No one's helping me. 12 and 19 is 31. And then you have 1919 to 1957 is 38. Midnight. And then from here to here is what? 5789. I don't need to know this. I don't know why I'm doing this. 22. 22. Is it 32? 5767, 7788. 32. Okay. Okay, so in, in terms of Ezekiel 8, this is, and this is what Daniel's been hitting on recently. Very, very strongly. Image of jealousy. Ezekiel 8. Then secret chambers. Right? Weeping for a Tammuz. And bowing to the sun. Other lines you can put on there. Okay, if, I hope you have this because this is coming off too. Why do we need to know this? We need to know this because of this. Nine eleven, we go back to the old paths. And we're going to be tested by these four generations. And we're going to go through them in order. One, two, three, Four. And the Lord is going to judge us in this history. Where does the Lord, where does the Lord judge? If you've listened to Daniel's sermons and you can't answer that question, then you need to go listen to his sermons again. When does the Lord judge for this apostasy? Visiting the iniquity of the third and fourth generation. It's in this generation here that the judgment takes place. It's in this generation here that the judgment of Adventism took place. And when you get to 9-11 and go back to the old past, this new covenant people, when does the Lord enter into covenant with the 144,000? They're the fourth generation. They begin right here in 1989, but when does he enter into covenant with them? Now, wouldn't they be the... Because the fourth generation, though, ends at 1989. No, it goes on. Okay. 
Okay. They're, they're still alive. This is a progressive fall. 1989, Saul and David are anointed. Wh what happens to Saul in 1989? He's demon-possessed. Okay, this is where he's trying to kill David. David is anointed here for the second time. And what happens with David's horn right here? It buds out. Scripture says it buds out. This is the budding out of David's horn. Who is David? David's over here. He's going to be anointed a third and a fourth time. When's the third time that David's anointed? Midnight cry. Sunday law is the fourth time he's anointed. But here, he's anointed and his horn begins to bud out. What is David's horn? What is a horn? In the United States, it's a power, but in the United States, what are the two horns? Republicanism and Protestantism. Who is David? Is he the prophet? Is he the priest? Or is he the king? He's the king. Right here, the throne of David is put, up, put in place, lifted up. This is David's throne getting lifted, lifted up. This is King David. His power begins in 9-11. He rules where? From 9-11 to the midnight cry. In Hebron. How many years does he rule in Hebron? Seven, seven and a half. How many years does he rule in Jerusalem? Because the midnight cry is Jerusalem. 33 years. Okay, we went through this just recently. This is his third anointing. This is the story of the throne of David. Prophet, priest, king. The story of the king is the story of the throne of David. It's not the story of Christ. Christ is the example, but prophetically, in our history, it's about the throne being established. So when you get to 9-11, you're going to be hit with these four generational sins. So, when you get to the last four general conference presidents. Okay, there's more to say. I had to put all that in place to remind us. On page 8, um, the last four general conference presidents, you have them there. You have Neil Wilson who's the father of the cur current General Pro Conference president. And he's followed by Robin, Robert Falkenberg, the only General Conference president to be forced out of office because of his legal problems. Followed by John Paulson, the European General Conference president. Followed by the current General Conference president, Ted Wilson. Okay, so here I, I, I thought about taking us, bringing information. I'll just tell you, you know that the Vatican is designed as a woman's sex organ, right? And that there came a point in history where the Roman Catholic Church put out a reward and someone accepted the reward to go get a world-famous phallic symbol that was in Egypt. A big phallic symbol that was in Egypt. It's the very phallic symbol that when Jeremiah went into Egypt after the destruction of Jerusalem, he cursed that idol. And later on in history, the Roman Catholic Church said, we will give a reward to anyone that can take that phallic symbol and bring it to the Vatican. And one guy took up the offer and he did it. And he went to Egypt and he took this obelisk from Egypt, the one that Jeremiah had cursed, and he put it on a boat and took it to Rome. And it is now in the courtyard of the Vatican. And every morning, the shadow from that phallic symbol points in to the front door of the Vatican. Okay, that's part of the story of the the construction of the Vatican. My point here is that the Catholic Church, it's all about fornication. Okay? It's about committing fornication with the kings of the earth, and it's all about fornication, but it's idolatry. It is your classic image of jealousy. You follow me? But you can't separate church and state, corrupt church and state from the Catholic Church as the image of jealousy. 
And the first generation of the last four generations of Adventist presidents was Neil Wilson. And here's a couple things that he put in the public record. This is in a court case. So this is a legal document to this very day. The General Conference President of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, page 8 of your notes. Although it is true that there was a period in the life of the Seventh-day Adventist Church when the denomination took a distinctly anti-Roman Catholic viewpoint, that attitude on the Church's part was nothing more than a manifestation of widespread anti-popery among conservative Protestant denominations in the early part of this century and the larger latter part of the last, which has now been consigned to the historical trash heap so far as Seventh-day Adventist Church is concerned. He don't believe the Catholic Church is the Antichrist of Bible prophecy any longer. This is generation number one. He's failing the image of jealousy test. He's lifting up the very symbol of the image of jealousy, of idolatry, of idol worship that makes God's jealousy come alive. He also said, there is another universal and truly Catholic organization, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I couldn't dig it out, but I know he said it. There's another place where he says, I like to call my vice presidents cardinals. Okay. Neil Wilson is a symbol of this generation failing this test and the, of the last four of the 20 General Conference presidents. He was followed by Falkenberg, who was forced out of the General Conference presidency because of a bunch of financial shenanigans that he did. Okay, but they kept it secret. And the government dropped the charges if he would only resign. They kept it secret. This is just one snippet from the Los Angeles Times from 1999. The international head of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, dodged by questions about his financial ties to a Sacramento investor, resigned his post Monday after nearly a decade at the top of the 10 million member church. Robert S. Falkenberg, the son of missionary parents and the president of the fast-growing denomination since 1990, told associates that the controversy over his financial dealings was detracting from God's work. That is the way you say in Adventism, I don't want to go to prison. Okay. Falkenberg, 58, had become entangled in a messy lawsuit lawsuit filed last August by Sacramento businessman James Moore, who alleges that Falkenberg and other Adventist officials cheated him and a charitable trust out of eight million in promissory notes in a land deal in El Dorado County. I mean, if you didn't do it, you stand and vindicate yourself if you didn't do it generally. Followed by John Paulson. John Paulson is the third generation. Do you see the secret chambers? Mm -hmm. His secrets got him in trouble. John Paulson. Paulson was the first world church president to hold a doctoral degree which he earned from the University of Tübingen in Germany, or to whatever. He considers the late Edward Ted Heppenstall, a longtime Adventist seminary professor, to have been a key theological mentor. Now, you, it takes time to deal with this, but in the third generation, the problems in Adventism in the first two generations are brought about by Adventism. But the problem in the second two generation is brought about by apostate Protestantism and Rome. Why, can I, why am I making that distinction? Because of the 2520. The temple is first trampled down by paganism and then it's trampled down by papalism. There's two distinct desolations that take place. And in Adventism, there was two distinct desolations. The problem in here was all self-inflicted. Okay, we're rejecting our foundation message. We're rejecting the message of Jones and Wagner. We're rejecting the counsel from the prophetess. But here, we've reached out to the theologians of apostate Protestantism and Rome and the classic champion of apostate Protestantism salvation the theology is a guy named Heppenstall. And anyone that knows about new theology and Adventism knows this the is the case. And this European, John Paulson, he's the 
third generation of these last four Adventist presidents, and he's saying, the man that is my mentor, the, the one that's my hero, is Heppenstall, in agreement with apostate Protestant salvation theology. Okay, Edward Hepsenstahl was profoundly influenced by Bible teacher W.W. W. Prescott. Hepenstahl gets his point of reference right here. Hepenstahl's basing his theology upon Prescott, and this particular General Conference president says, Hepenstahl is my man, and Hepenstahl says, W.W. W. Prescott is my man. Do you see it? Third, fourth generation. W.W. W. Prescott with his Christ-centered approach and his emphasis on righteousness by faith. Prescott having been present at the famous Minneapolis Conference of 1888. How many of those people were on the right side of the issue at the Minneapolis Conference in 1888? Willie, maybe? Jones, Wagner, Sister White? Sister White says, I'm out of here. And her angel says, no, you've got to stay and record this. They're repeating the history of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Okay, so the fact that W.W. W. Prescott was at that conference session doesn't mean a whole deal, big deal in, in the scheme of things. Um, now, here again, we note an important formative influence on Hepenstahl's theology. Pope Benedict, the, the one that's in retirement now, okay, the 16th, served as Pope and sovereign of, Vati of the Vatican City State from 2005 until his resignation in 2013, graduated from the same university as this guy. Okay, so he, he had W.W. W. Prescott's apostate Protestant leanings through Heppenstahl, and he had the leanings of Roman Catholicism through his university education. And this is where the false latter rain message is put in place. The third and fourth generation. Therefore, Ted Wilson is the final president. And he will be the president of the general conference when the Sunday law comes. And, and he's the last generation. How do you know that, how, why do you know he's the last generation? Because at the Sunday law, he's typified by Zedekiah. What happened to Zedekiah's children? They were all slain, and he got to watch, and then Zedekiah's eyes were put out. Okay, Wilson doesn't have any, any generation that follows him at the Sunday Law. They all die. But that's why it's, we, we put this in the record quite some time ago, and the idea that the Seventh-day Adventist Church said, no, we're going to replace Ted Wilson here this year. Oh, well, that was kind of a bad application. Not so much. Not so much. Okay, there's also a line of thought about the seven thunders. Okay, from 1798 to... I'll do it over here. From 1798 to 1844, there are seven thunders. And from 1989 to the Sunday Law, there are seven thunders. And this is old news. But we've taken repeatedly the last seven churches, last seven kings of Judah and the last seven kings of Israel and plugged them into this history of the seven thunders and here as well. And I'm saying that the last seven kings of Judah would typify the last seven presidents of the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, right? If your prophetic application is going to be correct. So, you have them on the top of page 9. Branson would be Manasseh, that would be 1989. Reuben Richard Figura would be Ammon, and Robert Pearson in the boldface would be Josiah, who died in 1989. Hmm. And Josiah was what? He was a good king. Of these kings here, Manasseh, Ammon, Josiah, Jehoiahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah, which of them might you say were good? With Josiah, but you gotta, 
you got to hedge your bets there, right? Because Josiah makes a mistake at the end. But he sought to work a, a, a reformation, did he not? I mean, typically at the, at the basic level, when we talk about Josiah, we talk about his work and tearing down the idols and trying to do a reformation. He just lost his way at the end. Okay, and he would line up with a guy named Robert Pearson, followed by the last four presidents that we just went over. Underneath that, you see the biblical characters that would typify this last president, Ted Wilson, Aaron, Eli, King Saul, Rehoboam, Zedekiah, Caiaphas, and A.G. Daniels. You can demonstrate that line up on line. But Robert Pearson, who's lining up with Josiah, what he's known for is he attempted to bring a reformation to Adventism while he was president. And it didn't work, but he gave it I guess his best shot. Okay, here's some, this is, this is just off Wikipedia. Even Wikipedia will give you this. In October 1978, faced with the risk of incurring a stroke due to the relentless pressures of his presidency to the surprise of all those attending a session at the annual council, he announced his retirement from the presidency effective January 3rd, 1979. What happened in 1979? The King of the South invaded Af Afghanistan and a 10-year proxy war began and op Adventism had opportunity to start waking up to what was going to happen in 1989, but they slept on. But he had tried leading up to that to bring about a reformation in Adventism. Here's part of what he said, thank you brethren and sis sisters for giving me the privilege of serving you for the past 45 years. Hmm. And may God bless every one of you. Pearson gave his last public message on October 26, 1978, the day that Pope John Paul II was elected as Pope. In his final appeal, he mentions the four generations of Adventism. You ought to read his final appeal. You have it there. It deals with this very thing we're talking about. Okay, now he's the one that lines up with Josiah. And in his last attempt to warn the church of the Omega Apostasy, his appeal at the 1973 Annual Council was for a revival and reformation of true godliness in the church to prepare the church for the climatic events of the future. The lack of interest by both laity and leadership to this appeal was later described by him as the greatest disappointment in my life. Okay, so even the last seven presidents of the General Conference line up with the seven thunders. They line up with the four generations of Adventism, but notice when Pearson died. Pearson died on January 21st. Really? I forewarned you all a few presentations ago. He died on January 21st. What's January 21st? A symbol of rebellion as represented by January 21st, 1535 and January 21st, 1793. What happened on January 1st, 1535? The first Protestant was slain in France. What happened on January 21st, 1793? The King of France was slain. Both were rebellion. And that's when Pearson died, January 21st. But now, Bronwyn pointed to this. Give me just a couple minutes to bind this off. Familiar quote for all of us, Daniel 8.14, and she pointed out it's Daniel 8.13 and 14, the central pillar and foundation of Adventism. Great Controversy 409, the scripture which above all others had been both the foundation and central pillar of the Advent faith was the declaration unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. I was going to spend time there looking at the disappointment how it impacted the Millerites then. I wanted to put that in the record. I'll come back to that. But I want to take us now to the scripture reading. Because Brother Stephen from Ireland, uh, you're, you're, you're not supposed to move pillars. Okay? Pillars are landmarks. You can go through the scriptures and show that pillars are landmarks. They're memorials. Okay? In your notes you have Exodus... 3:21 and 22. Let's go there. Exodus 21, Exodus 13:21 and 22. Central pillar of Adventism 
if you ask an Adventist, was October 22nd, 1844, the, the central pillar of Adventism, the foundation and central pillar? How many in here would say amen? Go ahead, say amen. It's amen, all right? But if we were going to move that way, Mark, it would be bad, right? Amen. Okay, and I'm, what I'm saying is, Brother Stephen in Ireland may have moved it. Okay, so I, I, want, to, I want to explain myself. Verses 21 and 22 of Exodus 13 says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them, by, lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of a cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. If you remember the scripture reading, what Daniel read from Numbers 9 is when the pillar was over the temple, whether it was a cloud or fire, they were to stay in their tents. But no, and it emphasized it. It was kind of redundant almost. When that pillar moved, you moved. When it stopped, you stopped. But who was moving that pillar? It's okay for God to move the pillar. But it's not okay for you or me to move a pillar. And what's the central pillar of Adventism? Uh, October 20... What'd you say? <laughs> October 22nd, 1844. Oh, you said Daniel 8.14. You'll see that in Genesis 9.26, Lot's wife becomes a pillar of salt. And there's some other references to pillars. So, let me... Give me five minutes. I'm so sorry. But I, I, I can't bring you to this without doing this. Do you remember this study that Stephen recognized that on October 22nd, 1844, that if you go 1844 days into the future, where do you get to? You get to November 9th, 1849. All right. And then you have this chart here, th this chart here, the 1850 chart, because now the Lord, what's he going to do with the 1850 chart? He's going to correct, gonna correct the mistakes. But what, are they going to correct the mistakes and then put it in the museum and shut it away forever? No. What's he going to do with it? He's going to use it for what? A tool to, reach to tool to reach outside of Adventism. This whole history, they're doing an internal work among themselves. In every covenant line history, that's the case. There's an internal work that precedes an evangelical outreach. Mm -hmm. So the Lord intended them to reach out, but 1863 was ahead. He had further light to give them. He was going to give them light on the 2520 in 1856 but they weren't w willing to receive that light. And what, what Brother Stephen did is he moved this pillar. He moved the pillar because he, he showed that, remember, Satan's a good Bible student. Satan recognized where we were going. So Satan had a prediction in place that in 2014 there would be a Sunday law. That was a lie. Absolutely. There, was, there was no Sunday law in 2014. There were two witnesses to what 2014 would represent. One, it would represent 1888 because the 126 began in 1888. And because the two 2520s teach us that this 2520, as typified by the 2520 against Judah, that ended on October 22nd, 1844, that it would line up here too. So when you get to 2014, you have two prophecies telling you that 1888 has to be repeated, the rebellion of Minneapolis, and that October 22nd, 1844 
would need to be repeated. And what Brother Stephen did is he showed that there was 1,844 days that took us to November 9th, 2019, paralleled by this history. And what did he do? He moved the pillar. What pillar? The pillar that Adventism had always saw. Adventism will tell you, I purposely made you all do it, is October 22nd, 1844, the foundation and central pillar of Adventism? And you all said yes. But it's an incomplete answer. This history here of 1844 is this entire history. And right here, it's identifying when the pillar moves. The pillar moves. Why? Because now it's time to leave the tents. And now it's time to take a message to the public. How did he move that pillar? How did he move that pillar? Not Stephen. God moved that pillar. Stephen saw the light that moved that pillar. And we've been, we've been under a cloud of disappointment because we thought... We were taught that this history here, that if you hadn't finalized your character by November 9th, 1849, you were gone. But that's not true, was it? It wasn't true for the Millerites. They still got an 1850 chart. They still got light to come by Hiram Edson. And they could have chose wrong here even if they didn't. We've, had, we've been approaching this history from a, a wrong viewpoint. What this history is teaching us is that at the end of 1800 and 44 days on November 9th, 2019, we got a public work to do. We got a public work to do. Well, why is that significant? Because since shortly after 2001, through God's Word, we came to understand that we're supposed to stay in our tents and our messages for Adventism. And not until God moves the pillar are we supposed to get out of the tents and take a message to the world. But here on November 9th, 2019, what did we see? We saw Mount Carmel. And we saw here was November 9th, 2019. And this was the offering, the satanic offering of P&T. And over 20 of their predictions failed. The prophets of Baal and the priest of the groves, the men and the boy had made their prediction. The men and the women had made their prediction. But Elijah had a prediction. July 18th, 2020. And we, we see now a prediction that isn't going to Adventism. Where is it going? It's going to the inhabitants of Nashville. What the Lord did here was parallel this history, but we were so overwhelmed by this satanic predictions of November 9th that we couldn't see that what was really happening is at the end of 1844 days, the Lord says, okay, I'm moving the pillar. It's no longer you stay in your tents and you teach Adventism. Now I got a message you take to the world. You see, you see my point? The pillar had moved. This history here was to prepare people to give a public message, just like it was in this history, line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. Amen. So Stephen was used to move that pillar, and now we can see that this is where the fire comes down and confirms the prediction of Elijah. Just one more. Right now they're doing their dance of deception. Yeah, right now they're cutting themselves. They're doing their dance of deception. They, here's something now. I want, to, I want to bring this together and close. <laughs> Honest, I will. And I said this a, a, a several days ago. In the fourth generation, whether it's Adventism or this movement, we get tested here at 9-11. I understood what I taught repeatedly it's when this fourth gen or third and fourth generation of apostates gets to the Sunday law, I would teach, they will have no spiritual strength to stand against the Sunday law because they will have cut themselves off from the Holy Spirit. There's a logic to that, right? But what's blown my mind is I didn't realize 
It's not just that. It's that in this history here, or this history here, they get turned into Catholics. That's what Neil Wilson did in the first of the last four generations. He's saying, we're Catholics. I call my vice presidents cardinals. Okay, they've been passed by. But who would have thought that the Omega movement here, in this movement, the rebellion would actually turn that group into Catholics? Okay, but we've seen it happen. We've seen that they foisted their error upon Catholic dispensationalism. We've, we've confirmed that from the record. We know now that Parminder does confessionals with both men and women, one-on-one, -on -one, and encourages them to do that. Um, we know that they praise the Jesuit order. Um, and I'm probably forgetting a few things. Uh, Parminder said several months ago that the keeping of the Sabbath was the worst thing that could have happened to Adventism. The worst thing that could happen to Adventism was keeping of Sabbath, Parminder said, and that we may have to apologize to the Pope of Rome. But, but let me show you one other thing. Now, the argument, if I don't know if it's an argument, I don't know what they're doing. They're saying we're wrong about July 18th, right? Um, even the death of the Pope that went into captivity in 1798. He died on August 29th, 1789. And 220 years later, on August 29th, 2019, Parminder and Tess are reading the bull to Stephen and Odilio about teaching July 18th and saying, you are heretics. If you're going to teach this, you're cut off, okay? Papalism's coming back into their movement big time. But, you know, there's been two Vatican, Vatican I and Vatican II sessions. You know that, right? Mm -hmm. Vatican II is the Catholic Church's plan on how to infiltrate the Protestant world. That's what Vatican II is about. And, and it's a meeting that took place over th a three-year period. But Vatican I, that took pa place back in history. And the, the most important thing about Vatican I, do, what's the most important thing about Vatican I, Brother Larry? You, you, you don't know? Okay, the most important thing is, this is where the doctrine of papal infallibility oh, yeah. is introduced. I might be spelling that wrong, because I'm fallible. Alright? And did, did not P and T, do they not claim to be infallible? Because the Omega is perfect, okay? So it's just another Catholic characteristic. And this was, this doctrine of Catholicism was put into the record in the Vatican I Council. And that was in the year 1870. Really? 1870, the doctrine of infallibility was put in place? What's 1870? Oh. It's 187. They're saying we're infallible and you're fallible. Isn't 187 July 18th? Uh -huh. Okay, so in 1870, the doctrine of infallibility comes into Ro Roman Catholicism and this Omega movement is not just going to not have the spiritual strength to not bow down to the sun. They're turning full-fledged into Catholics. Anyone remember the vision of Sister White where she looks out her window and she sees a bunch of people that she knew well and she turns away and she looks back and they've turned into a Catholic pr procession? Yes. Oh. <laughs> By the way, the doctrine of infallibility... When was it put in place in 1870? Wow. July 18th, 1870. Wow. That's a doubling. Absolutely amazing. Is that amazing or what? They will show on July 18th just how really fallible they are. And how Catholic they are. Yeah. Shall we pray? Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're bringing Daniel's last vision into clarity. We're thanking you for the second witnesses of the, the time patterns, the chronology, the numbers. 
we thank you for these things, but they are alarming as well that time is, is quickly running through the hourglass, uh, that we have a work to do and a, a world to warn, and we're unprepared. We ask that you would continue to awaken us to our responsibility and continue to empower us to carry this message. We thank you for blessing us to be prepared in this ministry to have the technical tools to be sending this message far and wide. Uh, you get all the glory and honor for that. And we ask a blessing upon that work in Jesus' name. Amen.